I've been waiting for my challengers and warriors to arrive after buying them from Battlefront in March. Unfortunately, they disappeared into the COVID wilderness somewhere and these are the replacements I bought from an Australian supplier. Join me as we have a look at the new Challenger kit. This is the Challenger Armoured Troop box set in 15mm from Battlefront. Challenger is the new British tank released with the updated British forces for Team Yankee. It has the same gun and fire control as Chieftain but has better armour, mobility and optics. The Challenger box set contains five vehicles. These can be built as the basic Challenger or the up-armoured Romor version used in the 1991 Gulf War. Romor stands for Royal Ordnance Military Operational Requirement. Challenger has Romor fitted to the side skirts and to the front of the hull. The first Romor packages were designed and built in Britain before being sent to Saudi Arabia to be fitted to the vehicles. If we have a look at the back of the box, there are two images of complete tanks, one basic one and one Romor Challenger. There's also an exploded assembly diagram with the optional parts clearly labelled in red. The box contains five Challenger tanks and four unit cards. There's also a resin tank commander sprue that's not listed here with three commander figures. You'll need to use superglue to attach these to your kit. Note that the box doesn't contain any decals. This seems to be a decision by Battlefront going forward. Decals are now available as a separate product you need to buy. Let's look at the plastic. Each Challenger comes on two sprues of olive green plastic. Detail looks crisply moulded and well defined, up to the usual current Battlefront standard. The first sprue has the upper and lower turret parts as well as the lower hull and side skirts. There's lots of nice moulded on detail on the turret including tools. The Lotus hatch is moulded closed but the Commander's hatch is a separate part. This has open or closed options. The smoke discharges were a weak detail on the Chieftain turret. Here they're also a bit simplified due to limitations in the plastic moulding process which can't handle undercuts. It's okay for a wargaming kit. These side skirts are for the standard Challenger. You can also see here the 120mm L11A5 rifled main gun with thermal sleeve. The second sprue has the tracks, upper hull, Romor side skirts and the commander's hatches. There's plenty of nice engine deck and grill detail moulded onto the upper hull. Lots of stuff to bring out with dry brushing when you're painting. The tracks are one piece parts. The tracks are keyed so they only fit on the correct way. Road wheels look okay with some strong bolt detail. The tracks have a fairly simple block pattern which becomes almost indistinct over the top of the track run. There are also sink marks in the track just above the drive sprocket, but all this should be hidden by the fenders and side skirts. The side skirts on this sprue are for the Romor Up Armoured Challenger version. Romor is a reactive armour package for Challenger that increases protection, particularly against heat rounds. Although it is a bit out of the original Team Yankee timeline, it's a good option to have in the kit. This brings us to the Commander's Hatches and Machine Gun. There are open and closed options for the hatch. The commander's station is fitted with a 7.62mm machine gun. The other parts here are the hull Romor package and some fuel drums. You could use the fuel drums with either version, but the instructions suggest using them for the Romor version. So that's the plastic for the new Challenger tank. It didn't fall together like the Chieftain kit, but the end result is nice. The parts are well engineered and are up to Battlefront's usual standard for wargaming plastic kits. They really have got a lot of experience with this now and consistently bring out quality models. The only real issue I had was a gap between the upper and lower hull at the front. Assembling the hull parts before attaching the tracks avoided this. Plus the gap is covered by the Romor hull armour if you're building that version. Just something to be aware of. The parts count is nice and low and features like the one-piece tracks make them quick to build. This is important in a wargaming kit where you need to build a few of them. Having the standard and Romor versions give players options. The buzz online is that the Romor challenges are a tough nut to crack. I haven't used them yet, 
but that's what I'm hearing. The resin crew figures indicate Battlefront's ongoing dilemma with figures and materials. If I remember correctly, they already have a hard plastic tooling for modern British tank commanders, but the figures supplied with this kit are resin. The detail looks okay, I'm sure they'll do fine. Not including decals in their box sets is a change I think a few people might have missed. Instead of including them in the price of the kit, these are now a separate product you need to buy. I guess this is fair enough as a cost-saving measure, but it does make an expensive hobby just that bit more of a strain on the wallet. Here's TBR950, the British decal set. It contains four decal sheets with these markings. It includes vehicle tactical markings as well as RAF roundels for aircraft and helicopters. Cost for this is 13 US dollars. That's currently about 235 million Australian dollars. The unit cards are a generic British Forces card as well as an Armoured Squadron HQ and two troop cards. The cards are combination cards with the stats for both the standard and row more challenges. More about the stats later. Let's look at some history. This is FV 4030-4 known as Challenger 1. This tank was originally designed as a heavily modified chieftain for Iran. However, after the failure of the British MBT-80 project and the fall of the Shah of Iran, the design was selected to replace chieftain in British service. The gun and fire control system were similar to the existing chieftain design, but the main difference was the added protection from the composite armour and better mobility from the hydropneumatic suspension. Composite armour gives greater protection than rolled homogeneous armour, particularly against heat rounds. The characteristics of this armour results in the flat shape of the tank, especially noticeable on the turret faces. Crew is four men, a gunner, commander, loader and driver. The main gun is the L11A5 120mm rifled gun. Thermal imaging was added to the vehicle with TOGS, the thermal observation and gunnery sight. This allows fighting when targets are obscured by dust or smoke as well as at night. Challenger entered British Army service in 1983 and deployed to Saudi Arabia for the Gulf War in Operation Granby. In February 1991, a Challenger tank recorded the longest range tank on tank kill at 4.7 kilometres or nearly 3 miles. This design continued frontline service with the British Army until 2001 when it was replaced by the Challenger 2. Challenger 1 continues in service with the Royal Jordanian Army. Let's look at using the Challenger on the tabletop. The card is for an armoured troop of the Royal Hussars and is a composite card for both the standard tank and the Romor version. Challenger is a tank unit with the Cobham armour and thermal imaging special rules. Cobham armour gives Challenger a side armour of 16 against heat warheads. Thermal imaging means you roll twice for night visibility and take the highest score. It also means the tank doesn't suffer to hit penalties for firing at night or through smoke. Courage, morale and counter-attack are 4+, while skill, remount and assault are 3+. These are the same crew stats as on the Chieftain. Challenger is also hit on a 4+. It's the armour stat where we see the biggest difference. The standard Challenger has front armour of 20, side 8 and top 2. The Romor version is even more heavily protected with 21 over the front arc, 10 on the side and top 2. Remember for both of these that the side armour is 16 for heat weapons. The thick armour is going to make Challenger a tough nut to crack. Milan's AT of 21 is largely ineffective unless you manoeuvre for a side shot. This is going to have opponents reaching for air power like Frogfoot and Hind to crack the armour. But again, Challenger will run if the rest of the formation breaks, so maybe concentrating on that is the more effective strategy. Tactical move is the same 10 inches or 25 centimetres as Chieftain, but dash speeds are better, reflecting the new suspension. Crosses are 2+. Plus or 3 plus for row more upgraded tanks. The stats for the L11 120mm main gun are also the same as Chieftain. Range is 40 inches or 100 centimetres with a halted rate of fire of 2 and moving of 1. AT is 22 with a 2 plus firepower. The gun is brutal, has a laser rangefinder and stabiliser and can fire smoke. Brutal means infantry and unarmoured tank teams must re-roll successful saves. 
Laser rangefinder means no to hit penalty for engaging targets over 16 inches. While stabiliser means the tank can make a 14 inch or 35 cm tactical move with a plus one penalty to hit when firing. I think the key stat here is the rate of fire one on the move. Unlike some other modern NATO tanks which retain rate of fire two on the move, if Challenger has to redeploy on the table its number of shots halves. This reflects loading the two part 120mm rounds. British players will be tempted to be more static with their challenges, firing from cover at long range. However, swarms of cheaper tanks at the ranges you get on a standard 6x4 table will soon outflank these tanks without good flank screens. Finally, there's a 7.62mm AA machine gun, as well as a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun. One other factor that anyone fielding Challenger will face is the points cost. Standard Challengers are 11 points each. Row more ones are an extra 2 points per tank, up to 13 points. So that extra point of front armour protection comes at a significant cost. You're more likely to take a troop of three challengers as a black box attachment to another force than fielding a full challenger squadron. If you do field a squadron in a 100 point game, you might not have much else. So that's the Battlefront Challenger kit for British forces in Team Yankee. It's a great kit and it builds up really well. Having the standard and row more options gives British players choices about timelines and tactics and the upgraded armour from the Chieftain will make them a real handful for your opponents on the tabletop. But the unit cost is eye-watering. I know West German players are rolling their eyes, but it really does mean you don't get much change for other units in a 100-point game. Fielding a Challenger Armoured Squadron means you really need your tanks to perform. As I said, you're actually more likely to take these as an attached tank trip to another formation. When you're buying these, keep in mind that decals are now a separate product you'll need to buy, but the decals will suit lots of British vehicles, not just your tanks. I haven't decided how I'll use my challenges yet. I had just planned a three-tank troop as an attachment to my mechanised infantry formation. My nearest opponent has East Germans, with dozens of T-55AM2s. It would be interesting to see if they could swamp me for flank shots or if a squadron of challengers could hold them off. If we ever get a chance to play together again, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs>